Patients these days are smarter than ever. They have tons of information that's accessible on the internet, just like this. And one of the questions that's come up lately are the questions about the different approaches to total knee replacement. And that's the information that, that I'm going to share with you in today's video. Hello and welcome back. I'm Adam Rosen. Thanks again for watching. If you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe. And if you could take a moment and click the little thumbs up button below, it really helps people like you find content like this. So knee replacement. There's not one way to do it. Um, there are lots of different implants. You can do it manual or robotic. There are different alignment philosophies like kinematic, mechanical, anatomic, and there are different surgical approaches and patients nowadays are starting to find out about the different approaches and many are curious as to what the difference is and is there a best. And that's what I'm gonna cover with you in these next few minutes. So when we talk about approaches to the knee for total knee replacement, there's three common approaches. There's the median parapatellar arthrotomy, there is the mid vastus approach, and there is the sub vastus approach. Now, the median parapatellar arthrotomy is the most commonly used, the most utilitarian. In complex cases, we can do certain things like quad snips and BY turndowns to expose more of the knee if it is needed, and it's pretty much the workhorse when you're working around the knee. Now, the other option is what's called the mid-vastus. Mid-vastus approach is similar to the parapatellar, but there's that incision that sort of exits obliquely into the VMO muscle, and this preserves the insertion of that muscle. And the idea is that it doesn't disrupt that extensor mechanism, which is the quad tendon, kneecap, patellar tendon, and where they attach to the quad muscle and the, the shin bone or tibia, and this might accelerate the rehab. Now, this is also similar to the subvastus approach, where we're coming even more obliquely and underneath the, the muscle and helping slide that over to the other side of the knee so it doesn't disrupt the extensor mechanism at all. If you've watched some of my other videos, you know that I like to share what the science says. So this is sort of a brief overview of some scientific studies. Now, there's a study that dates back to 1991. This was a study by Aaron Hoffman, and he looked at the subvastus approach. And what he described, which is what we know, is the subvastus approach is not new. It was first described in 1929, and his conclusion was that this was a viable technique for total knee replacement. Now, more recent studies have looked at the different approaches, and one study in 2020 found that the mini subvastus had better outcomes, and their conclusion that the mini subvastus was superior to other approaches and surgeons should consider this. Now, about a year later, there were a couple other studies that came out. So there was a meta-analysis, which is a study where they look at lots of studies and they try to gain a conclusion by, by combining all of the results of these studies. And what they found was there was no difference in the short or medium term as far as outcomes with the different approaches. And their conclusion stated, quote, based on these results, all studied surgical approaches to perform total knee replacement are equal, end quote. Now, other studies in that same year looked at the different approaches. So this study looked at, does the surgical approach affect the outcome of a total knee replacement? And what they found was that there was no difference. And specifically, the subvastus patients in this group had lower ranges of motion. But there was another study in that same year that looked at the subvastus compared to the parapatellar. And what they found that the subvastus does not improve outcomes and has a higher incidence of wound healing problems. So a bunch of studies really not showing not only a difference, but sometimes decreased outcomes as far as range of motion and wound complications. A more recent study that was done two years ago in 2023 found that the subvastus approach led to a fast track recovery and that quad sparing approaches such as the subvastus were superior, but only in early postoperative periods. Now, a number of patients have been asking about the Jiffy Knee, and the Jiffy Knee was created by Dr. Manish Patel, and he'd actually contacted me directly on LinkedIn saying that he thought that I would be a good fit for his program. When we corresponded back and forth a few times, he then let me know that he only teaches his, what he describes as this medial oblique modified subvastus approach to the knee to private surgeons. He doesn't teach surgeons that teach other surgeons. 
like me that teach either residents or fellows. Now, in getting ready for this video to talk about the different approaches for the knee, I sent a message back to him asking if he could give me any additional information that I could share with people, and I haven't heard back from them. This was about a month ago. And again, based on the science, if you go to PubMed and you type in Jiffy Knee, there are zero results as far as outcomes specifically with the Jiffy Knee. Now, a lot of doctors that I know around the globe have transitioned more recently to the subvastus. Some even call it the comb over technique because we're making this incision underneath the VMO and the subvastus approach pulls everything over the top of the thigh bone, sort of like a comb over. And I've heard from a lot of friends and colleagues that they say that their patients are doing better earlier on. And that's kind of what some of the studies show, although some didn't show a difference, sh some did show that there were early improvements in the early post-operative period. Now, another knee thing that patients ask about is what's called the nano knee. So the nano knee was a coin termed by Dr. Thomas Farrow. And again, if you go to PubMed and type in nano knee, there are zero results. Um, Ho, and again, they are in close proximity um, to LA. They actually wrote up about the nano knee and they said, quote, the nano knee is a creative marketing term used by a medical group to advertise outpatient total knee replacement. And again, they don't describe it as a particular implant, although they do have a custom knee implant option. And you can get a custom knee implant basically anywhere, but no one again has proven that one particular implant in the world is the best. Otherwise, every surgeon in the world would be putting in one implant. So there are lots of different options when we talk about implants. There are lots of different approaches. And more frequently now, pretty much everywhere, is total knee replacement surgery is being done as an outpatient. Okay, well, if you've gotten this far, I hope this has answered some of your questions. And what's my takeaway from all of this? Well, I've been doing knee replacement for over 20 years. I have done the median peripatellar arthrotomy. I have done the mid-vastus approach. I have done the sub-vastus approach. And in my patients, I haven't seen a significant difference. Now, I have taken the time to really modify my technique to be very tissue sparing and very cautious with how we treat the tissue to prevent a major inflammatory response. I mean, this is a traumatic surgery. This causes a lot of trauma, but the less traumatizing that you can be, we believe that this results in less pain. I have my own retractors. I teach our fellows how I do it step by step. This has made the surgery efficient. It has also cut down on the length of the surgery time because we know that also decreases complications such as things like infections. I just don't have a fancy name for it. Now, a lot of my friends and colleagues around the country and around the globe uh, in the past year or so have really switched over to this comb over and they are just seeing early recoveries. My personal experience over decades wasn't that the approaches were making a significant difference in the outcome. And if so, it was really hard to measure. But I think what's made the biggest difference and what I hope surgeons that are doing some of these techniques, if they're teaching other surgeons, are really pressing on the importance of perioperative nutrition that has improved recovery. The idea of modi modal preemptive analgesia, big fancy term for different medications to hit the different pain receptors started prior to the surgical insult. And also the idea of early aggressive physical therapy. In the old days, it was pretty common to be at bed rest. And those patients then kind of got behind the eight ball before they ever got started. But the important thing to take away from all of this is that you need to find a surgeon that you like. You need to find a surgeon that you trust. You need to find a high volume total joint replacement surgeon that does this on a regular basis and have faith in them for whichever approach works well in their hands. And as long as they have the appropriate physical therapy protocols and the pain management protocols, the odds are that you're going to have a good outcome. Because even the studies that do show improvements, a lot of the subvastus improvements were in the first couple weeks. And the midterm, long-term data showed no major difference. So you don't want to try to force a surgeon to use an approach that they're not comfortable or familiar with because this starts to complicate things and this is where things can go south and then you have a surgeon that's doing an approach they're not used to and now maybe you've asked them to use a robot if they have access to it but they're not used to and then maybe 
a different implant that they're not used to. And when you start to add in all of these variables, it takes away the focus of the goal of the surgery, which is to replace your knee and to do it well and to give you a well-aligned, well-balanced knee. Because in the end of the day, that is what's going to give you the best function and the best result in the long term. So I hope this has answered more questions than caused questions to come up, but I'd be curious to see your thoughts, comments in the notes. What approach did you have? How was your recovery at two weeks, six weeks, three months? Are you happy with the result? And if you could go back and do anything different, would you? Thanks again for watching. I'm Adam Rosen. Until next time, stay safe.